thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for enduring the, the hard floor. Um, uh, and uh, uh, because of the, um, the situation in the room, I will try to get to the conversational part of this as quickly as possible. Um, but as speakers tend to do, I also probably loaded this, uh, this up with too many slides. So um, I'll try to rush through it. Uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this uh, long conversation. Um, on cosmopolitics and, uh, and cosmopolitanism in general. Uh, it's something I think a lot about, and as I've immersed myself in uh, trying to understand the variety of effects that Google is having on our lives, um, it strikes me that there is, within Google, two of the shallowest um, simulations of cosmopolitan sensibility uh, exhibited um, by Google and by our experience with Google. One is a sense of um, uh, almost technological imperialism, a notion that uh, certain forms of technological organization uh, are um, good for everybody because they're good for somebody. Uh, and, and secondly, the all too familiar um, simulation of cosmopolitanism one finds with uh, wealthy and successful multinational corporations uh, who have the ability to transcend borders and nationalities uh, and do so in some pretty deft ways, um, some pretty um, uh, skillful ways. Uh, and Google is no exception to this. In fact, Google may have uh, mastered this effort up to a point, and, and, I'll, and I'll get to that. Um, so I have, I have this book coming out uh, uh, in 2010 called the Googleization of everything. Uh, and through this presentation, I'll sort of explain what I mean by both Googleization and by everything. Um, uh, this book was sparked by a growing sense of both curiosity and unease. Uh, and those are actually really good motivators um, for studying anything in depth. Um, curiosity because Google is such a fascinating institution, such a successful institution, and one that has in remarkably short time immersed itself in our daily lives, uh, in our pockets, right? In our, in our mobile devices, we have, we have access to this company and its services, and yet, I've never written a check to this company, and you've probably never written a check to this company, uh, and still, it, it, it serves as uh, a paradigm of commercial success, a paradigm in many cases of uh, pretensions toward corporate responsibility. You know, it has a very uh, strong focus on um, doing very little harm in the world uh, and doing a lot of good in the world. Uh, that's definitely part of its uh, profile, both internally and externally. It's one of the reasons people go to work for Google. It's one of the reasons people feel comfortable interacting with Google in such intimate ways. Google has naturalized itself into our lives to the point where not only that it is a commonly used verb, that's sign enough that it is naturalized in our lives, but think of the number of times you interact with Google without even thinking about the brand, without even thinking about entering the Google universe. Think about how permeable the membrane is between what you see in the real and what you see in the simulation of the real when you interact with Google Maps, when you interact with YouTube, when you interact with Google Earth, when you interact with Google Mail, when you do a basic web search. The number of times per day that your eyes drop from the horizon to the screen and back without even thinking about what you're doing. The number of times per day that your hands touch the keys that send signals to Google, that inform Google of your curiosities, your preferences, maybe your obsessions and your fetishes even, right? But, but you do so unthinkingly, I, I posit to guess, because I know I do. Uh, and part of the effort in the last four years as I've immersed myself in, in, in everything Google, um, I've tried to denaturalize the experience, at least for myself. I've tried to remember that this is weird. This is odd. This is a strange way to be human. And yet it is a very common way to be human for those of us lucky enough to live in a technology-rich, networked life. Right? And of course, that implies a certain level of skill, a certain level of education, a certain level of privilege, a certain level of uh, uh, technological access. Again, reminding myself that just because I live this way, not everybody lives this way. Reminding myself that just because I live this way doesn't mean that I lived this way 10 years ago, and I certainly did not. 
and you did not either. And yet, am I living better? In some ways, yes. What is the cost of that? Nothing's free. What am I giving up for that? What am I giving up for getting the sense of immediacy, the sense of immediate gratification? Is my interaction with Google an expression of my most childish desires, right? The desire to get answers fast, get information fast, take the right direction and not get lost, right? Is my impatience with the real world such an important part of my personality that I depend in an unhealthy way on all of the services of this company? And what does the company get from me? What is the nature of the transaction? Those are the sorts of questions that have obsessed me for the last few years. And I, I'm not sure I actually have any answers to those questions, but I love posing them because I think everybody has some sense of uh, what those questions mean. Now, I wrote this book largely because it built on what I had done before in some very important ways. Um, I started out my scholarly career wondering about how copyright affects creativity, wondering about the ways in which legal regimes and technological regimes in many ways dictate, if not influence, creative choices. And so my first book, Copyrights and Copy Wrongs, came out of that set of questions. Uh, I saw in the world of hip hop things changing very fast. Uh, uh, artists making explicit decisions to use this sample and not this sample because of what the lawyer said. So essentially the lawyers were co-composers of much of what was going on in hip-hop in the 1990s. That sparked a series of questions that of course drew me into the digital. Uh, my second book was about the peer-to-peer -peer world. Not just its effect on the music industry, but its effect on how we imagine our relation to information in the world. Right, uh, how we deal with the global information ecosystem. And of course, those two questions led directly into Google because of Google Book Search, which debuted in 2004, uh, or at least was part of a declaration in 2004 that Google would scan in 20 million volumes of works from libraries, mostly in the United States, but ultimately from around the world, uh, and would um, scan them in without regard for copyright clearance, would present them in a truncated form if they, in fact, were under copyright, um, and uh, would essentially offer us full text search to ultimately 20 million volumes. This seemed like a really exciting notion at the time. Um, in fact, Lawrence Lessig, one of the uh, uh, founders of, of cyber law and, and, and certainly one of the most influential critics of copyright, uh, said at the time, that Google would, of course, revolutionize our world through this, that, that actually presenting this rich trove of knowledge, centuries of knowledge, mostly in English but not exclusively, to the world would be uh, a good thing in almost every way. Um, I wasn't so sure. I wasn't so sure not because I didn't agree with the ends. I thought the ends were noble and, in fact, doable. I thought the ends were doable for a while. I think we have the technology and the will and the desire to present a tremendous amount of knowledge to almost everybody in the world if we actually set our minds to it. Um, the tools we have are now inexpensive enough, resilient enough, dependable enough, good enough platforms for creativity that we could even out a lot of the discrepancies of information access in the world, again, if we set our minds to it. But instead of setting our minds to it as a species, as a people, in a global sense, or even in a national sense, we relinquished that duty to one aggressive company, which seemed too good to be true. And that was the moment in 2004 when I said, wait a minute, Google is doing what the rest of us should be doing, what libraries of the world should be doing, what universities of the world should be doing, what states should be doing, maybe what UNESCO should be doing. But because we can't get our act together, we've created a vacuum and Google is stepping into it. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's ultimately what we want. But still, I was uneasy about this. I had seen this play out too many times, especially in the United States, this notion of what I call public failure. When the public institutions don't come through, when the public institutions don't live up to their charge, and instead of saying they should work better, they should be governed better, at least in the United States, we get the perverse argument that the public institution never should have been do trying this, right? The public institution is destined to fail because of its publicness. 